And it re uh, fits really well, I think, uh, uh, that we get to the first lecture of uh, today by Eleonora Hoff and Colin Cornell. Eleonora Hoff studied theology in Leuven in Belgium and in Amsterdam and did her PhD research at the Protestant Theological University in Amsterdam in the field of missiology about post-colonial theology. Currently, she is a pastor in the United Protestant Church in Belgium in Ypres. Colin Cornell is Old Testament scholar and biblical theologian. He worked as visiting professor of biblical studies in the School of Theology at the University of the South in Sewanee. He's now the coordinator of the Center for Religion and Environment, also at the University of the South. He published, among other themes, about aggression and violence uh, in the theology of the Hebrew Bible, and already also several articles about Miskotte and especially the translation project. Um, speaking of which, we just heard that the book, uh, the ebook uh, particularly, is number one on Amazon in the systematic theology section. Uh, that is, of course, wonderful news, uh, and congratulations, first of all, to the both of you, Colin and Eleonora. Uh, before we uh, get to listen to you, uh, again, the reminder to all, please feel free to put your questions and other thoughts in the chat so we can respond to them later. Eleonora and Colin, I'm delighted to give the floor to the both of you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Marco, for this uh, introduction. And it's a uh, delight to um, introduce this um, translation and more specifically the translation process. And I'm so happy that yesterday we devoted so much time to actually speak about um, the potential for theology that Ms. Cotta's work has. But today we actually want to focus a little bit more on the genesis of this whole project and also on um, some of the translation choices that we, um, that we made. Um, because for both of us, Colin and I, um, the translation process in us was very important to, um, to go through as, an, um, as we've always been very intimately involved with the, um, with the theory and practice of translation. Um, both of us actually went to Nepal to pursue an internship with, um, with SIL, the, um, the society that actually is in, involved in um, translation projects of the Bible all over the, over the world. So um, we've actually um, transferred some of our energy and interest that is um, usually involved for Bible translation onto this work because we were so much involved in the whole theoretical discussions about translation of the Bible that we actually just were like, okay, we want to translate. We want to know how it works, what kind of decisions we should make and what our intended outcomes, our intended goal is, how we handle the, the source text. There were a lot of decisions we made and I can say that um, we have enjoyed the process tremendously. It was a very long process, but also it was a very enjoyable process because we could um, discuss the issues at, um, at hand at length and we were very grateful for the opportunity to do so. Um, so today um, we would like to share a little bit of our own journey, how we came to say that this book definitely should have been translated into English. And we also um, want to talk a little bit about some of the technical decisions that we made um, during the translation process. And um, in the end, we also want to share a bit about um, the relevance and how we think the biblical ABCs might be useful, both in an um, academic, but also in a very um, practical um, context in the local congregations. Um, so as for... Um, um, as for me, um, I grew up in a um, theological environment that valued the translation of the Bible um, was always a point of contention, a point of discussion. Um, I'm very happy to 
um, to say that my dear aunt, who was a Bible translator together with her husband in Papua New Guinea, has really influenced my, um, my outlook on reading the Bible, the importance of Bible reading, and also the importance of translation. Um, furthermore, I come from a background where um, in sermons, a lot of times it was said that like, okay, the Bible is translated like this, but the Greek really says this and this and this. So I haven't really known a time where um, translation was not important. And actually from um, a relatively young age in my theological journey, I started um, collecting um, different Bible translations. Um, and I also went to pursue a master's in Bible translation at the Freie Universiteit in Amsterdam. Um, and, and during that time, I um, got more involved in thinking about the approach to, to translation. And I also got involved in the um, so-called Amsterdam School of Theology, who itself is very heavily um, involved in debating the finer points of um, translation of the Bible. And for example, in books like um, this that luistert now, it means like... Um, there is a very narrow kind of approach to, um, to translation. So I, um, I adopted the idea of the foundational words of, um, of the Bible and how important it is to render them rightly and to really um, understand the structure of the, the biblical witness um, figures like um, Sokoman, a really important um, to me, here you see some, um, one of his works. So this, um, this interest in, in Bible translation and the, uh, the so Amsterdam School of Theology have been um, influencing my thoughts for, um, for a long time. And um, together with this, um, this whole strand of translation um, came also another interest, and that is the um, the interest of um, resistance. And actually, um, after finishing up my, um, my PhD in post-colonial theology, I was ready to take up a new project or actually ready to take up um, an old love again. And I, um, that was right around the time that um, the biography of Miss Cotta um, appeared, so I got that as a present for my um, PhD defense. I got to reading it and I was really enarmored by it. And I recognized so many um, strands in Miss Cotta's life where I was like, yeah, we also live in times where it's very important to, um, to take a stand, to, um, to resist what is wrong and dehumanizing in the world. And so I came to um, reading the biblical ABCs um, again and finding um, it's so useful to see the, um, the emphasis on the name and really um, adhering yourself to this grammar of scripture to not only reading, but also letting yourself be read by the Bible and also to... Um, to reclaim this sense of urgency, especially in the context of um, an up and coming um, anti-Semitism that obviously is never, um, anti-Semitism never has left us, unfortunately, but um, it became more and more poignant that um, the, um, yeah, the darker strands of history are, are gathering, especially after um, Charlottesville in, um, 2017, I think most Americans will vividly remember where um, alt-right people and Nazis um, marched th through the streets and were shouting, Jews will not replace us. And that kind of was a turning point for us. Um, Colin and I were um, at that point already in conversation and we were um, really appalled by the very open um, anti-Semitism that was on display. and. Um, we actually came to the conclusion that, right, this is, this is the moment we, we have here, this voice, Ms. Kota, he's so deep and powerful and he's just not available in, in English. And we were at that moment um, 
primarily concerned for the, um, for the American context. And that concern has really never, um, never waned. And so we could actually say that this, um, yeah, that Charlottesville kind of was a turning point for us and also spoke very um, deeply to the relevance of having um, Ms. Kota translated in English. So now I actually want to give the words to Colin and um, so he can tell um, a little bit more about how he came to, um, to the translation process. Yeah, thank you, Eleonora. Um, I'll do a little backtracking with my own theological existence before moving the story forward with uh, our specific choices we made uh, in translating Miskota's biblical ABCs. Um, like Eleonora has already mentioned, uh, I uh, began early on in my uh, theological trajectory uh, as a wannabe Bible translator. Um, and uh, like Eleonora mentioned, uh, she and I both were in Nepal and returned from uh, that internship experience um, with a desire to pursue further education. Uh, she um, at the Free University and, and I returned to Princeton Seminary. Um, by the way, is, is the sound coming through okay? I see a few frozen, frozen faces. Okay, good, yeah, thank you. You're good, yeah, we see and hear loud and clear. Very good, thanks Marco. Um, yeah, so I, I uh, returned to the U.S. and uh, studied at Princeton Seminary, uh, which is an important note. Uh, Eleonora uh, observed that her training um, familiarized her with the Amsterdam School of Biblical Interpretation. And uh, perhaps in a parallel way, my own studies at Princeton Seminary acquainted me with uh, the whole school of dialectical theology. Karl Barth, but also some of his fellow travelers, Boltmann, Bonhoeffer, and other figures in that same stream. Uh, so that's one thread uh, that's shared between our story and preparation is an interest in translation and Bible translation. But as Eleonora mentioned, uh, that um, preparation really resulted in us having a familiarity with translation theory. Uh, we mentioned in our panel yesterday some of the options that are commonly uh, discussed in, in translation circles, such as dynamic equivalence, formal equivalence. So th this was sort of our, our world for, for some time. Uh, I was thinking deeply, carefully about the, the craft of translation. The other thread uh, that bears mentioning in my case uh, is my interest in Old Testament. Marco, in his introduction, kindly mentioned uh, Old Testament studies as my primary research area. Uh, but even as I pursued doctoral work in Old Testament scholarship, my interest remained really in uh, how the forms of scripture work constructively. And so uh, theologians who were important for me were folks like Walter Brueggemann, Terry Fretheim, a few English language uh, researchers who really seek to mobilize biblical texts in all their kind of formal contour in a constructive theological direction. And it was another, a third uh, American scholar, a Brevard Childs, through whom I first learned of Miskota and indeed of the entire Amsterdam school. Uh, because in the English language theological world, if there are any places where Miskota's name is still remembered, it is among the students of Brevard Childs. And Brevard Childs, in fact, mentioned Miskota positively uh, towards the end of one of his major works on biblical theology. And it was, in fact, a uh, sort of student at second hand of Brevard Childs, um, who first encouraged me as early as 2013 to read Miskota. So that was sort of in, in the background for me. Um, and the third thread besides translation theory, Bible translation, Old Testament theology, in my case, the third thread uh, is like with Eleonora, resistance. Uh, all through my doctoral studies, uh, which happened in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, I was participating 
in grassroots organizing uh, on the streets. Um, maybe a few of you know what a peace marshal is, folks who are at protests and rallies who are sort of uh, forming the perimeter of those kinds of events. So that was also my world, was in the streets, working towards racial justice in sort of a major American city, uh, and therefore being very close at hand uh, with kind of the um, agitation and uh, resurgence of uh, not even very dormant forces uh, in, in defense of uh, white supremacy, white power, and so on. So I was looking during my whole doctoral work for some ways to bridge these experiences. My area of study, Old Testament, uh, my specific interest in theology, Old Testament theology and the doctrine of God, and a, a real careful uh, galvan galvanizing kind of resistance. Um, and it was uh, as such, uh, all those three threads kind of came together when I ran across online a presentation by Eleonora uh, on Miskota as a theologian of resistance, um, as a resistance theologian. And uh, I read her paper, which she had uploaded to an academic website with great uh, interest and reached out to her to thank her for putting that uh, work uh, online. And uh, we began a correspondence then and, uh, and voiced a shared concern, as she's mentioned, about uh, resurgent um, sort of forces uh, of racism and anti-Semitism in the US context. And it was shortly after that, actually, that she and I met for the first time um, here, where I am now today in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, and it was actually, I don't know if Eleonora, you, re you re recall, but it was, I think, in that first in-person meeting that we had ever had after corresponding that Eleonora mentioned uh, this work by Miskota, uh, and, and pitched the idea that we should pursue a translation, which was very ambitious, uh, given our station in life, and especially my <laughs> lack at the time of any uh, Dutch language skills. Um, but uh, we, we followed that up and kind of piloted a, a draft of the first chapter, just to sort of see experimentally what that would be like to do. Um, and uh, we very quickly ran into... Uh, some of the major uh, technical choices that, that have to, uh, translators must engage. Um, and so uh, I, can, I can speak, Eleonora, to, to one of those very first issues that we ran across. I'll also just say, in terms of framing the translation decisions that Eleonora and I had to make, that uh, our, our work that resulted from it uh, does not actually conform either to a dynamic equivalence or to a formal equivalence model of translation. Uh, the English language, biblical ABCs, really features some uh, phenomena that are quite formal, and on the other hand, makes some, some bold, some risky uh, choices um, in a very dynamic direction. So, uh, but very early on, Eleanor and I faced a decision about how to render the title which is singular in Dutch and in most European languages into which Miskota's book has been translated, um, biblical ABC, referring to the roster of letters comprising the alphabet. But in American English, uh, different perhaps from British English, it is never uh, referred to uh, in singular. We always say biblical ABCs in plural though it refers to a singular entity, the alphabet. Um, and so uh, that was a, a sort of push and pull that we uh, instantly encountered while considering uh, working further uh, with this translation project. Um, and uh, in the end, we, we opted for the more dynamic equivalence being uh, the translation that will register and not sound funny to, uh, to an American ear, which is the, the plural, biblical ABCs. Um, so that was a first, uh, an important decision that we, we had to make, even as we were uh, just beginning, just sketching out the outlines of a first chapter uh, from Miskota's work. Um, 
So the other important decision we faced, and maybe I don't know, Eleanor, if you want to take over from here, but had to do with which uh, edition of Miskota to work with. Would you want to speak to that, Eleanor? Uh, yes, sure. Yeah. Um, I actually thought it pretty interesting that we had to think about um, which edition to use because it also um, speaks to the um, complexity of translation and that a book is just never just a book as a fixed text, but that there can be different versions. And um, especially in the case of the biblical ABCs, um, it really was a work in progress in a certain sense for um, Miskolta since he revised um, the biblical ABCs in 1966. So during that revision, he basically did um, two things. Firstly, to um, clarify um, some instances where the 1941 edition was not um, very clear. And also he um, change the scope of the book to speak to um, the changing times and especially to the um, to the new idea of nihilism that was um, um, raging across Europe. So I really commend uh, Miss Cotta for um, reading the signs of the time once more and I think it's um, very impressive that he um, that he read those signs in 1966 um, in a new way and also adapted the biblical ABCs in a way that would um, fit in this new time period. But actually we were um, reflecting on nihilism and we were thinking that um, our world is not very nihilistic and also not very postmodern anymore since the, um, the grand ideas are back but a lot of times those are not really the ideas that we want back especially when it's um, a new kind of blut und boden theology that is um, resurfacing so after some deliberation and also trying to read the signs of our times again um, we decided that we could actually better um, stay with the 1941 edition because we saw that that would speak better to the to the current times actually. And also we kind of liked um, the shorter lengths, um, the clarity, the, the sense of urgency, um, the sense of um, immediacy that speaks from the war edition. So that was a reason to, um, to, to keep the 1941 edition, but that also presented us with some difficulties since um, it was also not possible to completely ignore the newer version since there were actually some um, helpful changes made. So um, we decided to sometimes actually go with the 1966 edition, but um, at the end of the book you'll see a list where we have amended to the 1966 edition. So this actually was a pretty difficult choice since um, we have translated from a source text that does not exist in this very form in Dutch, basically. Um, but we've um, consulted um, Rinsel Reining Brouwer, who was very um, helpful, and he encouraged us um, to to go with this um, this decision. And we also really hope that this is um, this is helpful for all of you. Um, but I'm actually not opposed to the idea of um, translating some of the longer. Um, editions in a 1966 edition because they are helpful and interesting in their own rights. So it would actually be quite nice to have them up on our uh, website. So who knows for a later project that would be possible. Yeah, I, I'll speak to you as well. Um, uh, so with regard to the, the 1941 edition, uh, in cer certain ways, it bears a close kinship with uh, Miskota's other wartime work, Edda and Torah, uh, which as Eleonora has mentioned, resonates with um, a lot of sort of the resurgent and even kind of a reinvented uh, paganism. Um, and uh, it was in preparation for our translation project that I was trying to read through all Miskota's uh, bibliography um, as much as I was able in German and halting Dutch. Uh, and um, in, in that uh, Edda and Torah work, it was remarkable to me, speaking of the currency of these ideas, to see uh, authors with whom Miskota is engaging, who are, were essentially uh, Steve Bannon's recommended 
reading list. Um, just to say again, the sort of uh, currency uh, uh, of, some, of some of this work. Uh, whereas the uh, When the Gods Are Silent After the War, as Eleanor has mentioned, much more concerned with, uh, with specific um, trends of that moment. Uh, and so, but we had all of those works kind of uh, around us and, and in consultation as we were trying to translate uh, the 1941 edition of Biblical ABCs. I'll also say, uh, we, I also had, and we both had, um, Heinrich Stövesant's German translation uh, before us as well. And so our process of translating Biblical ABCs was a matter of looking at the 1941 edition, looking at the subsequent post-war edition with Miskota's own revisions, which were sometimes the additions he made were oriented towards the post-war nihilism, but sometimes also he just was clarifying his own earlier uh, enigmatic statement. And so in such cases, we decided, ah, that is actually helpful to sort of leave in, but, but annotating it as such. Um, and then also sometimes the uh, translation by Heinrich Stövesant uh, also provided some kind of clarity that was helpful for us in trying to even just come to terms with some of Miskota's very uh, challenging uh, syntax uh, in Dutch and so on. So, so that, that, that was uh, somewhat of our process uh, as translators. Um, I'll also uh, speak, uh, Eleonora, to another decision that we faced relatively early on had to do with how to render uh, some of Miskota's semi-technical theological vocabulary. So one of the uh, influential contributions of biblical ABCs, uh, as well as uh, When the Gods Are Silent, Miskota's post-war magnum opus of a sort, uh, is a family of words uh, derived from the Dutch grund, root. Um, and uh, so he says uh, things like grund leinen, ground lines. Uh, and the German translations of Miskota's works can take advantage of uh, the existence of a German cognate, Grund. So German has the option easily of uh, rendering that Dutch family of words that Miskota uses in kind of a specific, almost technical way. Whereas English does not have a ready-made equivalent uh, to that. And certainly not in a way that flags its signal programmatic importance to Miskota's whole project. Uh, so we observed that previous English language translations of Miskota's works uh, rendered those words with basic or foundational. So basic words, foundational words, uh, referring to uh, the words that really structure the entirety of biblical ABCs, word, way, sanctification, the name, uh, these items that Miskota discerns as scaffolding Hebrew scripture and really the whole two testamented Christian Bible at large, uh, no easy way in English to say, to sort of instantly um, signal, that the, to telegraph that these are a specific, um, uh, really important repertoire of words. Uh, and I, I'm of, I was of a mind, and I saw in the chat the question about uh, what we think of the 19... Uh, 60s, uh, when, the, uh, when the gods are silent English translation, I'm of a mind that basic words or foundational words in English does not communicate that special role that Miskota and others after him in the Amsterdam school lend to that set of words uh, in scripture. And so uh, Eleanor and I, uh, maybe we were headed towards uh, sort of a um, dynamic equivalence in terms of the title, Biblical ABCs, and some of the other choices that we made. But in this case, we actually uh, decided in a quite opposite direction to keep the Dutch. We just left in the Dutch words, ground lines, ground pattern, ground words, and so on, uh, and italicized them, and then uh, put in a, a sort of very rough English gloss, like I just said, ground words, which is not a term of art in any English language theology. Um, but we wanted to help our readers to understand that these words have a programmatic stature. 
in Miskota's project. And we thought that was one way to do that is just to leave it in Dutch and have it be a, a semi-technical term. And in fact, our, our hope uh, is that just as certain English uh, language theological works uh, leave in certain specific German vocabulary, like you'll encounter in scholarship on Bart, Zacha is left in an English language text, theological subject matter, the Zacha is left in its integrity as a German word, or in a lot of biblical scholarship, sitz im Leben, or if you like, sitz in Literatur, and so on, is left in English because readers understand that that is a, as a technical term um, that doesn't quite have an English equivalent, uh, and it has enough uh, circulation that other English, English language readers can, uh, it's intelligible to them. And so similarly, uh, we, one of the contributions we hope with this work is that that family of words, rund wurden, and so on, uh, will come to be seen in close connection with Miskota and with really the, the Amsterdam school that arose uh, after him. So uh, anything else you want to add to that, Ms. Uh, Eleonora, that I've, I've left out? Uh, we might also speak um, to... No, that was actually uh, very clear. I think that we could um, move towards um, relevance a little bit now. And um, I will speak a little bit about um, my own context here in, um, in Ypres. And um, Colin um, will speak about the American context since he knows that's, um, that one best. Because um, I just, even though... Um, I work in a Dutch speaking context. Um, I find um, a lot of what um, Christoph said yesterday about um, congregational life, about communities to be very um, applicable. And um, for me, um, translating Miskolta has really helped me in my own wor work in, um, in a congregation. Um, and I've also tried to, um, to see if it was possible to have reading groups that, you know, are not a full um, house of learning um, leerhuis, but are um, trying to get at the foundational structures and the spiritual grammar of um, scripture. And I actually found that um, there was quite some, some interest, especially in um, a Catholic context where people are um, quite embarrassed about not knowing enough about the Bible as they should like. So I've encountered a lot of openness to learn more about the um, about the structure of of um, the biblical witness. So um, I hope that my experience is also um, translatable to some of you who are um, working as pastors in an ang um, anglophone context. Um, and for me, the most surprising thing actually was is how surprising this approach was for other people. Um, for example, we read um, Exodus 3 with the revelation of, um, of the name together. And um, so I tried to um, stress some of the, um, the structure of the Exodus narrative, for example, um, Exodus 12 with the Passover. And um, I was so surprised to see that for none of the people, even people who've been in church um, basically their whole life, they had no idea that registered for them like, okay, well, here this Exodus narrative, here Exodus 3, this revelation of the name is really the focal point here. This is something that we should know, we should remember, we should live by here. This is the revelation of the name. And um, for me, it was um, such, um, such a turning, turning point, maybe you could say, even in my... Um, in my ministry in the sense that it gave me a kind of renewed sense of urgency that what Ms. Cotta is doing in um, advocating for in the final chapter of the biblical ABC is that um, there is such a necessity to, um, to actually spell, um, spell scripture together, to read together, to understand, and to, um, to get at the heart of the, mat the matter and also to live out of it. And I think that's um, it's lacking at the moment, but also there is um, needs. A lot of people want to be emancipated. They want to be able to read together, to read for themselves, to understand. So um, I hope that this um, little snapshot of my 
pastoral practice in Iper might function as um, an admonition for those of you who are actually um, practitioners um, in congregations to try to see if it's possible to get some kind of um, house of learning or base hamidrash together and um, see how it goes, see if there is some um, interest. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Eleonora. Maybe I'll just uh, um, riff on that, that the, the house of learning piece, which will be unfamiliar to uh, many Anglophone readers, and then speak a little bit to how Miskota has uh, impacted my own work of ministry, such as it is. Uh, so Eleonora has uh, just alluded to the uh, Beit Midrash, um, or the Lair House, uh, which is an institution um, familiar, I suspect, to uh, Dutch and German language uh, readers. Um, and it traces back to one of Miskota's influential intellectual mentors, Franz Rosenzweig, the Jewish philosopher and theologian of the early 20th century, who founded um, uh, a house of learning, uh, a layer house um, in his own context in Germany uh, that was not to replace the synagogue, the house of worship, but was rather an ancillary, kind of a, a satellite, a, a help for the house of worship in that it would educate adult uh, Jewish people in their own heritage, scripturally, traditionally, and so on. And uh, that um, institution spread in German speaking and then also in Dutch speaking lands and was quite an inspiration to Miskota as well. In fact, impacted, I would say, even his doctrine of scripture that really has a twofold character, both scripture, both as kind of the site of divine revelation uh, and also as an ongoing instruction, a, a program of formation uh, in uh, one's life. Uh, but at any rate, that was a, a translation decision that we had we faced is how to translate this institution that has no uh, has no stature, has no existence in English speaking land, certainly not in the US. Um, and so we opted instead of saying house of learning, which means little to nothing. Uh, to most Americans, perhaps most uh, British people, uh, to say instead, Beit Midrash. So in place of Dutch Lehrhaus, we translated with Beit Midrash, which is also unfamiliar uh, to English language speakers, but at least has the virtue of describing an institution that does exist in Jewish communities in the US. That is that sort of house of learning that's alongside of the synagogue. Um, so Eleanor has mentioned a little bit of uh, how Biblical ABC's Miskota's approach has impacted her own ministry. I'll just say too, um, I have, haven't been in a pastorate, but for the past years have been teaching in a seminary context. Um, and uh, I, I, I've remarked to a few students along the way that um, I see some of my role as a catechist, refamiliarizing Christians with the very basics, refreshing in the basics of our Christian confession and faith, particularly uh, our scriptural heritage. And um, Miskota's uh, emphasis, which he absorbs in part from Rosenzweig and Buber and their project, paying close attention to the form, the sort of formal grammatical uh, contour of scripture has very much implicitly informed all the work of teaching that I have done. Um, so uh, uh, students of mine uh, sort of come out of class uh, just already uh, knowing to pay attention, for example, to beginnings and endings of biblical books, mm -hmm. which is a, a sort of a, a, a formal, a structural observation. Um, but it's one that I have learned from Bavard Childs, also from, from Miskota, is attending to the actual arrangement of the text. So they're not, it's not just haphazard, a drip pan dumping in the scraps. Uh, but rather is very deliberately, artfully uh, crafted um, in, a, in a very, uh, as I say, sort of a, a, a deliberate hermeneutical way. Uh, and so, again, I haven't raised Miskota's name in these contexts, but uh, that, uh, that piece of his approach has, has very deeply uh, affected my own work of teaching and of catechizing, is to raise to Christians' attention the actual shape of the canon of scripture. Um, 
So uh, that's the way it's impacted, impacted my own work of ministry. And also just to, to find in Miskota uh, a form of uh, robust theologizing from especially Hebrew scripture, but that takes up a strong note of uh, resistance and over againstness uh, to sort of the, the governing myths of one's culture. Uh, and that too has been very helpful in my own thinking, in my own uh, practice as well. Yeah, exactly. When you're um, referencing the governing myths in a culture, um, I also find that very um, poignant in my own practice of ministry because there is so many um, residual ideas about um, who God is supposed to be and that those ideas are just drifting, um, dr drifting around and people have this um, idea, especially about um, a God that's um, perpetually judging you, especially for um, sexual sins. There is a lot of um, repressed guilt from um, Catholic upbringing, and it really helps to um, remove um, the gods as we encounter God in scripture from all these um, ideas that are pretty unhelpful. And for me, it also has emboldened me, I think, to say if people have like really weird outlandish ideas about um, a distant God, I'm just like, okay, well, I don't believe in that kind of God either. And then just being pretty bold and just telling them like, okay, well, um, let's actually just see what the Bible got to say about um, about God and what kind of God that is. And um, I think people find that pretty um, surprising that it's possible to disagree with um, some very heavy-handed patriarchal ideas about God and just say like, okay, well, let's read carefully and let's see what kind of God um, appears then. And I think that's a very direct um, influence from um, Ms. Kota. Um, let's actually just go to the chat a little bit because there is an interesting discussion about if we were to turn our hands to another Ms. Kota project, translation project, which text do we want to tackle? That's a question by Phil. Well, even in yesterday's uh, small group session, um, talking to the translators, Eleonora, you had mentioned um, the, a, sh a shorter, thank thankfully shorter mm -hmm. work uh, yeah. by Misko that we might consider. So maybe you might say a few words about what that piece is. Um, yeah, this is Godsvijan dan Vergaan. We're actually um, hosting a reading group at the moment about this, um, about this little um, sermon. And we're... Um, just reading it every month on Zoom with a group of 10 to 15 people, which is very fruitful. And this is um, the sermon that was spoken by Ms. Kotta um, right after the liberation of the Netherlands um, in 1945 in the, um, the new church, the main church um, in Amsterdam, the main square. And um, it's a really poignant, prophetic sermon one might say um, it speaks to the unspeakable suffering during the war years, um, but it also provides us with a very um, stark and clear um, exposition on what happened in the war with the Shoah was much more than um, just general animosity or something like that, but it was a very deliberate attempt of um, oblit obliterating um, God's chosen people. So he, um, he provides a very early um, theological um, explanation of um, anti-Semitism and the, the horrors of the Shoah. And for that, um, especially because it's so close to the atrocities, um, it's very um, word reading and that this is definitely very high up my to-do list if I'm tackling another project. And in the chat, I'm seeing that um, Miriam is suggesting to translate Edda and Torah. Yes, so I, 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 I actually agree with Miriam in that case. And um, it, I thought it was striking and uh, noteworthy that the German translation of Edda and Torah, which is what I have here in my hand by uh, Heinrich Braunschweiger, 
uh, came out only in uh, 2017, I want to say, uh, and in a series on the Kulturelle Grundlagen Europas, cultural uh, foundations of Europe. Um, and the, the back uh, cover blurb actually uh, indicates its uh, current day significance. Um, so I think, again, this would be a, another translation project. Uh, I don't know if I'm ambitious to, <laughs> to try it, but, uh, but should be done. Um, and it is a very interesting, very, in some ways, um, unusual text uh, in that it juxtaposes uh, in a sustained way. It's a comparison between the Icelandic Edda, this epic work uh, from uh, Northern European uh, uh, pre-Christian, in, in a lot of ways, uh, religion and outlook, and then the Torah, uh, that is the, especially the Pentateuch. Um, and Miskota finds in both of these, uh, sort of in, in, in Edda, an epitome of, the, of paganism. Uh, and then of course in Torah, kind of a countervailing, uh, uh, sort of um, countervailing outlook, uh, if, if you will. Uh, and he doesn't identify Torah uh, as Christian, nor actually as Jewish, that the Israelite idiom is sort of a different and distinct uh, offering relative to Christianity, which he sees as fatally hybridized. It's sort of this fusion between Torah and paganism. Um, and then also sort of post-Israelite Judaism uh, is its own separate consideration as well. So a lot to debate and discuss there, but that is, I agree with Miriam, a work worthy of renewed attention. Yeah, I actually think it would be very timely to translate it. I'm together with Colin, not really sure if I would be um, up to it at the at the moment. But I would. But if there are people who would feel that they sh should or could contribute, it would actually be really wonderful to um, to use this conference as well to look to the future a little bit because it's very rare that um, so many people are together, especially from um, English speaking context as well. Um, so I would be really happy if we could um, get the momentum going. There is there is interest, there is a publisher. So if we um, could see that there would be some kind of like working group or a collaborative pro project or something like that, um, I think it would be very timely to um, to discuss that if some people would be uh, would be interested. <laughs>